Hello, I'm Evan Morgan. I'm the Vice President of Online Learning with Our Daily Bread Ministries. And we're uh, here with our series of conversations uh, with experts on different fields. And I'm here today with my wife, Elisa, joining me today. Good, Elisa. Yeah, good to be with you guys. I'm an author for Our Daily Bread and the co-host of Discover the Word and also God Hears Her. God Hears Her is a podcast for women. So we won't, you want to make sure you tune into that. All right. Well, we can't think of a better person than Philip Yancey to address the topic of our conversation today is uh, where is God in the midst of the pandemic? Um, I'm confident you're going to be uh, blessed by what he has to say and uh, answer some of the questions you might have as you face your own questions in this uh, very unusual time. Like many of you, I await each week anxiously for Philip's blog, <laughs> which comes out it's uh, maybe my favorite one that I read each week, and I just encourage you, if you're not already familiar with Philip's blog and uh, his other uh, items on his website, if you'll get a chance to go to his site, it's philipyancey.com, that's P-H-I-L-I-P -I -I with one L on philipyancey.com. So please take advantage of that. I think you'll find a lot of resources, and definitely sign up for his blog, and you'll find links to his social media, and. Uh, uh, you want to follow him regularly with that. You know, Philip has written tons of books, and many of you have read them. I think maybe 15 million copies have been sold just in English, and it's been all of his books have been translated into like 40 different languages. He's a he's a, a writer who thinks and a writer who processes what he's thinking, what what really represents what we're all thinking. Um, he and his wife Janet have been to over 85 countries. And Philip blogs about the, those experiences and the Christian world as it interacts with the secular world in all these countries. It's fascinating. So Philip kind of goes ahead of us all, learning for us, and then brings back the learning for us. And not to be missed with this, that Philip and his wife Janet have climbed all 54 <laughs> of Colorado's 14,000 plus foot peaks. And trust me, I've done one. And I just tell you, that is a very significant thing that they have accomplished. In fact, I think Philip's done some of them twice and three times because he's such an outdoor uh, enthusiast, as is his wife, Janet. We have been blessed to have Philip and Janet as our friends. And we have done a lot of life together over the last couple of decades. Uh, Philip and Janet have been there for us in crises, and I hope we've been supportive to them as well. I want to encourage you, if you're enjoying today's conversation, there are other resources at our Daily Bread Ministries that you can check out. Philip has been a guest on Discover the Word several times, and so we have a good Bible study time there. He's also been a guest of Aaron Eddy's and my own on God Hears Her, and his stories that he shares there about how he knows God sees the unsee unseeable, or those who feel unseen, will stay with you for a long time. He's also written for our Daily Bread devotional. So if you want to go to the website and just Google our website, just Google search for Philip Yancey, you're going to get a lot more resources as well. So welcome, Philip. We're so glad you're joining us here today. Thank you very much. We're not that far away, maybe 30 miles. We live <laughs> that far apart, but uh, here we are in each other's living room. So it's, it's a great way to do the program that you're doing. Well, we're blessed that you're able to join us because I know you're having a lot of folks uh, request these types of interviews because of what's been a passion of yours or maybe something that's just caused you to be inquisitive about some of the major questions of the faith that you've addressed personally and in your books over the years. Early on, uh, Philip, um, I've told you that I was very much blessed by, I think it was your first book that, yes. came, Where is God When It Hurts? Um, that book greatly ministered to me, and we were thinking about topics to say, uh, for today. I thought, what better uh, topic than to say, where is God in the midst of a pandemic? So I'm excited for you to begin to address that, and maybe you can, we can just start by asking what, way back in your 20s, I believe, caused you to address this particular topic? What led you um, to that? And then how has it developed since then? So tell us a little bit about how that uh, influenced you and then how it influenced your future writing. Sure. I started my career as a magazine journalist and I did a lot of articles of people who had been through trauma. In fact, for a number of years, I worked on uh, drama in real life, which was a series in Reader's Digest magazine. So I talked to people who were attacked by grizzly bears and caught in a blizzard and an avalanche, you know, a lot of those. Many of them were Christians because I had the contacts who 
line them up and they would tell me again and again, you know, the hardest thing for me was the visitors I got from church. <laughs> uh, I, here I am just trying to get well. I'm attached to all these tubes and wires. And then these visitors come in. They all have a different idea. Some of them say, uh, boy, you must have done something really bad. God is punishing you. And you need to have more faith and God will heal you. And then the next person, no, it's not God. It's the devil. The devil is attacking you. And the next person, no, it's not the devil, it's God, but not because he's punishing you, because he's chosen you to be an example to other people. And they said to me, I, I'm just trying to get well, and they're making me feel worse. <laughs> so as a, as a journalist, I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what the answer was. I didn't know what advice I could give to people like that. And I learned early on that if I don't know something, I should write a book about it. <laughs> mm -hmm because it gives me a chance to go out and to meet some people who can help me to study the Bible, to go to libraries, to just dive into a project full time. And the first one was the problem of pain. I was what, 26, 27 years old, had no business attacking a problem that has, has plagued great thinkers for centuries, but it, I had to find an answer. And it was in the process of doing that that I met Dr. Paul Brand, who became my co-author on three different books. And he, he has been a guide and mentor to me in this whole area of pain and suffering. You revised the book um, based on what you learned since that time. And what were some of the principles or points that or things or even a story that, that you did learn that, that drove you to revise your original work? Several things. Uh, a lot of my own writing is spurred on by responses I hear from readers. So a lot of people wrote in response to where is God when it hurts and, and they would say things like, well, that's very helpful if your problem is physical pain. That's not really my problem. My problem is my world is just falling apart. My kids are in prison or on drugs and my prayers don't get answered. And I'm, I'm just, I'm mad at God. I'm upset with God. And I thought, yeah, you're right. That's a whole new area. So I wrote the next book, Disappointment with God spurred on by these readers. As I look back on the letters I got early on to Where's God When It Hurts, a couple things came to mind. One is that I am convinced God is not orchestrating the pain. A lot of people, when something bad happens, they think of God up there with these arrows, you know, I'm gonna get him, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see what, what he's made of, zap, zap, zap. And the more I studied the Bible especially, I just didn't see that happening. When, when Jesus was around people who were suffering, like a man born blind, for example, either the disciples or the Pharisees would immediately jump on them and kind of like Job's friends, okay, what did he do wrong? What did he do? And Jesus always refuted that. You know, it wasn't anything that he did wrong. It wasn't these particular people that that tower fell on that God chose them. And he didn't really answer the question why, but he would say, don't come to that conclusion that God is specifically causing that pain on that person at this time. That's not something you can possibly understand. And I'm, I'm gonna refute it. And all the way through, I mean, that was the message of Job. Job's friends were sure it was Job's fault. They had this neat little theory and God at the end just blew it away. He didn't give the correct theory. He didn't explain why, but he just said, you guys are wrong. You're all wrong. The hero here is this guy you've been jumping on, Job. He's a hero because he believed in me even when he had no reason to believe in me. You guys thought you had it all figured out and you're wrong. And then he, kind of a, a twist at the end, he says, in fact, I won't even listen to your prayers unless you go through my servant, Job. I, so I learned from that, it's okay to cry out. It's okay to lament. I mean, go, I'm in the process of reading Job again, and Job says things that I, I would be scared to say to God, but he wasn't scared. He trusted God, and he knew God could handle it, and he just let it all out. This is not fair. The world is not fair, and God didn't say anything until the very end. At the very end, Job realized, it is a God I should have trusted all along. And I barely hung in there, but at least I did hang in there. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you. You wrote another bestseller, and I'm pretty sure every single book you've written has been a bestseller. But one I'm thinking about right now is on prayer. Mm -hmm. Prayer. Does it make any difference? Um, 
I can imagine that uh, a lot of folks right now have questions about how to pray in a pandemic. Yeah. You know, we, we feel a little bit helpless in, in our prayer times. Can you speak to that? Well, interesting you use that word helpless because that's my first prayer, help. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was uh, the author, the funny lady, Anne Lamont, who wrote a book and, and she said her two favorite prayers are help, 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 and thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs> and, and we're in a help, help, help period now, aren't we? Mm. Uh, and, and again, as I said with Job, if, if, you, if you're a little nervous about telling God exactly how you feel, go to a book like Job or go to the Psalms, go to Lamentations, because they'll give you the words to complain to God, <laughs> to mm. let him know how it feels. And that's okay. Mm. I, I'm just amazed that God would include that in our sacred scripture, the words to use to complain and judge God as being unfair. I mean, he can take it clearly because he included it in the Bible. I would say on prayer, once you get it out, there's also a, a listening part to prayer. And, and that's what I guess impressed me most as I was writing the book. I, I thought prayer was kind of a one-way conversation. I talk, I talk, and hopefully God listens. I'm later, more recently convinced that prayer is mostly listening. It's, it's listening to what role I should play in God's work in the world. We believe that God is at work in the world. And for some reason, God has chosen right now to mostly do that work through people like us. When Jesus was on earth, we, we saw clearly what God wanted done in the world. Jesus went around and responded to people with comfort, with healing, with hope, with practical help. You know, what is your need? How can I fill it? And now God depends on us, chooses us. We are the body of Christ. That, that's what that means. Jesus' body is not here anymore. It, it ascended. But he left the body behind, us. And the only way the world is going to know what God is like is if we show them what God is like. That's so good, Philip. And, and just to throw a little question in here that I hadn't even thought about, but you're bringing it to mind is you talked about how we see examples of how to pray, even when we don't know how to pray in Job. But do you see examples of listening in scripture where people listen and hear God directing them? And for the person that says, yeah, I don't know that I've ever heard God's voice. That yeah. sounds good. But yeah. what, how, how, when you're saying that's a key, yeah. how do you respond to that? I, I do know some examples. There's there's a beautiful one in uh, in about the prophet Elijah. You know, he, Elijah had just been through a demoralizing experience. He was running. He was being chased. He thought his life was in danger. He was really feeling sorry for himself, holed up in a cave. First, these birds came and brought him food, and he was feeling a little better because you know maybe God is up there. These birds just appeared out of nowhere with food for me, and and. And then he heard from God. He thought it would be thunder like Job or a whirlwind like Job, but it wasn't. It mm. was a whisper, mm. a barely audible whisper. And it was just God's way of saying, Elijah, you're not alone. Mm. I'm with you. I'm with you. And my pastor in, in Chicago, we lived in Chicago for many years, and my pastor said his first prayer each day was, God, Tell me what you're, you want done in Chicago today and how I can be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if we pray that prayer, one thing I pray in the morning is, okay, God, help me to treat the people who could be easily seen as interrupting my work <laughs> mm -hmm. as part of my work. You know, that unexpected phone call with a person I haven't talked to for years. And I, my first instinct is to get rid of this person so I can get back to my job. No, right now, that is my job. Mm. And that's a way of, of listening. And I, I ask God in advance in the morning, prepare me for those, those moments and, and make me turn up my hearing so that I'm more able to hear a prompting from you. The Holy Spirit is a gentle person. Mm. The Holy Spirit doesn't shout. It's often a little nudge. It's often a little voice, not even a voice, but just a, a mm. thought that comes into my mind. And sometimes that's a thought about who to pray for right now. When somebody comes to mind, just stop what I'm doing and, and pray for them. 
So that's keeping our eyes open. Yeah. That's one way God answers those prayers. It's not necessarily an audible voice or maybe even a whispering voice sometimes, although we, I think we'd all experience some of that at our times in our lives. Mm -hmm. It's keeping, keeping our eyes open for what he might want us to do. And especially as it relates now during this pandemic is how we can put shoes on this, if you will, put shoes on our theology. Yeah. You, you write extensively about your travels, how the church just amazes you whenever you're globally, when you travel, you found, wow, this is the body of Christ demonstrated. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about where, how you've seen that work around the world and how that might help us today in our own ministries. One incident comes immediately to mind. It's, it's a woman. I met in the Philippines. I was signing books. So there's a line of maybe 100 people and, hello, how are you? And I'll put her name in it, you know, and sign my name next, put, put her name in it. And uh, this one woman came up and said, could you put it to the so-and-so library? I said, sure. I endorsed it. So tell me about this library. She said, well, it's a school and I run this school. I said, oh, very good. Uh, how did that come about? She said, well, I was a new Christian. And I started reading in the Bible, and it said that we should take care of widows and orphans. And uh, there are a lot of orphans in my town, these street kids. They stop the cars at the red lights and, you know, wash the windshield, hoping you will give them a tip. And they, uh, who knows where they sleep? They just don't have any family. And so G Jesus and, and the epistles said we should care for widows and orphans. So I started inviting them into my home. I said, well, like how many? <laughs> She said, well, now I have 32. <laughs> you have 32 orphans in your home? She said, yes. And when I tried to send them to school, the schools didn't really like them. They saw the, these street urchins, you know, these, these homeless kids. We don't want them in our school. So they didn't welcome them. So I started my school for them. Wow. And, I, you know, in the United States, uh, if, if there's a problem, a social problem, first we, we appoint a committee to study it. And then we hire our legal team and then we uh, apply for 501c3 status and a board of directors and all this. You know, maybe three years from now, we'll have a little something that care for orphans. But when you're at the, at the street level, the ground level in some of these places, it's just amazing. And it, frankly, in this case of, of, of pain, I've learned so much from those who undergo persecution. China is in the news a lot and I'm, who knows what role they played in all of this. But... But we do know that China recently has been persecuting Christians. They've been knocking down crosses, bulldozing churches, shutting down unregistered churches. And I've been to China four or five times and I've met with some of these unregistered churches. Usually there's someone with me translating even when someone one is praying and, and never once did I hear them say, take this persecution away. Mm -hmm. And I asked my translator, could, could you inquire about that? And, and when she asked the people, they acted kind of puzzled and said, well, well, no. I mean, we just assume we're going to be persecuted. Our pastor was in jail for 27 years, you know. We just say, God help us to bear this persecution so that we may be a witness to others. So I come back from a place like that and, you know, back to our very organized uh, country and people are so upset because you can no longer say a prayer at a football game in high school or something. I say, we don't know what persecution is. And we have a lot to learn from the global church. It, it just uh, puts us to shame in a lot of ways. And yet they keep looking at the United States as the source of so much. Well, I'm treated like a, a hero when I go over there because I'm an American Christian that they've heard of, have read my books. And and, and yet when I go back, I feel so humbled because I think these are the real heroes. Mm. We have so much to learn from each other. You know, Philip, that what you just expressed is a kind of authenticity that I think is one of the reasons um, people love you, treat you like a hero, and want to read your writing. You express our doubts, our questions. You're one of us. You listen and learn and you process. Um, and you're not afraid to go into those wonky places that are uncomfortable and, and dig around in there and see what you can discover of God. How did you get to be at that level of transparency in your writing? I sometimes uh, put it this way, that I became a Christian because of my doubts. 
I, I learned to doubt some of the crazy things my church taught me. <laughs> I grew up in a very unhealthy church. It was in the South back in the 1960s, 1950s. It was, it was racist, blatantly racist, this angry, very narrow, um, independent, independent church. They thought maybe heaven would have 100, 120 people, but surely no more. <laughs> and they were going to be them. Right, right, right. And anything that looked like fun was, was against, you know, was a sin. And we heard uh, hellfire and brimstone damnation every Sunday, even though it was the same 120 people every Sunday. Uh, and gradually I learned, you know, I don't think Jesus is like he's being portrayed in this church. And I started looking at the Bible for myself and I, one by one, I start. I picked up these things: the racism and the and the legalism and the narrowness and and the hostility and the division, and started peeling them away. And actually, Elisa, that's been my career. Mm -hmm. uh, I I am blessed to be able to do in my books what I'm doing in my life. So I'll take. Uh, I told you that I write books when I don't know the answer to the question. So. My publisher one time told me, why don't you write a book about prayer? I, said, I don't know anything about prayer. I'm the world's worst prayer. <laughs> and then I thought, that's why I should write a book about prayer. <laughs> that will give me a chance to spend a year learning about prayer from people who do know something. And it's just been a, a privilege for me, truly a privilege to be able to to make a living doing what I would want to do anything anyway, to pick up the pieces of the gospel one by one, examine them, dust them off, you know, find out what's keeping and, and, and what's worth keeping and what was something that had, had just accreted because of uh, a culture or the church I grew up in, whatever. So that's who I am. I'm a person who asks the questions, who doesn't go with the party line unless I'm convinced of it. I so kind of skirt around the talk up topic and go into it until I find something I can I can live with and, and keep. So your writing is the same as your living in a way. Thank you for being that way. Wow. Oh the words are usually better than the living when you when you get <laughs> get right down to it. You can you can dress things up in a book, but uh, it's a little harder to it's a little harder to edit your life. <laughs> but I recall another one of your books, Philip, uh, I was just diagnosed with cancer, had the world by the tail right out of college, and I'm reading some of your books, and I can't remember the timing exactly, but at some point mm -hmm. after that, I was disappointed with God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I saw your your book, Disappointed with God, at some point, and I read it and underlined it. I can imagine people out there that right now are disappointed with God. You know, they're mm -hmm. saying it's, it's tough to see God when you're standing six feet apart at the end of an unemployment mm -hmm. line. It's yeah. tough to see God um, when I'm watching on an iPad my grandmother pass away without being able to, to see her. Uh, there's very natural times to say disappointment with God. And what I've appreciated is the you give some rational thinking to that. It's not sugar-coated, but it's really helped me. Maybe you can outline some of that. It's a, you know, some have said that the problem of pain and suffering and God's all-powerful nature is the Achilles heel of the faith. You know, mm -hmm. theologians even come up with a word for it. So it must be important called theodicy. So how do you reconcile all of that with, and that you write about it, but maybe you can give us the, the Cliff Notes <laughs> version of <laughs> what you've learned from that. Well, I wouldn't say it's the Achilles heel, but it's, it's the most vulnerable part of our faith, really, to a skeptic, to someone who chooses not to believe because we believe that God is all powerful and we believe that God is all loving. And it's pretty hard to put that together when you've got uh, several million people around the world suffering from a virus. And why doesn't God just eliminate all the coronaviruses in the world? So it's, it's, it's the hardest question that we have and philosophers, theologians have struggled with that for, for every year, for ever. There are a few places that give me a clue. One is the book of Job, where Job, if anybody had a right to complain, it was Job. Here's the most righteous man in the world who had been a justice person, who had treated his people well, who had, who had helped his whole community thrive, who helped the poor. 
and yet he's treated the worst. And his friends all said, well, it's obvious that you did something wrong and God is against you. And Job certainly felt like that. In fact, he called God like a lion ripping him apart. At the end, God appeared, and it's the longest speech by God in, in the entire Bible. Interestingly, God doesn't say a word about what, why Job was going through what he went through. What he basically said was, okay, Job, let's compare resumes, you and I. <laughs> and I go first. <laughs> but while you've been, while you have been whining and complaining, with good reason, your world has fallen apart. Let me tell you what I've been doing. And then he describes the universe. <laughs> you know, he describes uh, planets and stars and galaxies and then animals and they're they're wild animals, so the wild donkeys, the wild horses, the crocodile. And, and just gives him a tour of the universe and says, that's my job. That's what I've been doing. You're not the only person in the world, in the universe. And that alone, even though he didn't address the why question, that alone solved Job's doubts. He said, I spoke of things I couldn't possibly understand. I repent in dust and ashes. And I, the message I get from that is we can't understand. One of my favorite authors, Frederick Buechner, said to, to try to explain God's will and God's workings to somebody like Job or us would be like trying to explain Einstein to a little neck clam, you know, a little mollusk. Let me tell you about the theory of relativity, you know, whoop, whoop. And um, similarly, similarly, there's a, there's a fascinating passage in Daniel, Daniel 10. We all know Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den, great saint, courageous person. But he seemed to be accustomed to having his prayers answered. And this one prayer, he prayed and nothing happened. And he waited and he fasted and he used these special oils in his body. I don't know what all he was doing, but he, he was trying to get God to respond. And for two weeks, he got no response whatsoever. And then finally, this angel appears. And Daniel says, where have you been? I've been praying for two weeks. And the angel says, you have no idea. I had to fight battles just to get here. And, and I think when I look at the Bible and I say to Paul or to Peter, why, why didn't you just write a theodicy? Why didn't you explain everything for us? I think their response would be, well, what do you expect? This planet has been invaded by evil. Not everything that happens is God's desire. Clearly it's not. Jesus told us to pray. Some people pray every day that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not happening. Jesus was not pleased with the condition of the planet. Every time he saw someone with leprosy or a widow who had just lost her son or whatever, he would bring healing. He would bring hope. That's the kind of world that God wants. That's the kind of world that God has promised. And to judge God by what's happening at any moment in time, whether you're Job or Daniel or us in the era of coronavirus, we just don't have all the evidence. And faith means trusting, despite what things look like around us, trusting that God is good, God is loving, God is powerful. One phrase I sometimes use is faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Mm -hmm. Believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. That's helpful. It's we, I think you've mentioned that we have this conflicting thing going with somehow freedom and this broken world, you know, we're always living with that tension. Is that how you? Well, that's, that's certainly part of it. I mean, God gave us a, an outstanding world. I'm, I'm living in a house that has a lot of wood just all around me. I'm seeing wood trim and wood pillars and things like that and, and stonework. And I think, wow, this is great. I can build a, a house that lasts through storms and wind and snow in Colorado. But as soon as you have, a, have something like wood or stone that has a property of hardness, which is why it's so useful, yeah. but you populate it with free people, some of them will pick up a rock and throw it and, and hurt somebody <laughs> or hit them with a, with a baseball bat or something. Um, 
that's part of the problem of pain. It doesn't explain things like the coronavirus. There are, I, I guess I would just say that God is as displeased with parts of the world as we are. Jesus certainly was. And that's the image that we take away. And Jesus gave us a, a preview of what we believe God plans to do with the entire planet. There will be a time, we're promised, when, when um, there are no more tears, no more pain, no more death. So don't judge God by the condition of this planet at any given time mm -hmm. until the end. You're referencing um, the picture of God we have in Jesus, and Jesus was stunningly, surprisingly compassionate, even mm. in the face of evil. He didn't, had no tolerance for evil, but he had compassion in the results of it on our planet. And, and you and Janet have been um, compassionate towards Evan and I. We've had various trials and struggles and crises in our lives. And, and we can be compassionate for one another as the body of Christ, even in a world that's so broken and messed up and, and hurting and maybe even rejecting of compassion. Um, what would you say to all of us who desperately want to make a difference? Yes, in the days of a pandemic, but in the every day that has been changed because of a pandemic. I think we have a lot to learn from this pandemic. C.S. Lewis used a phrase that I, I flinch when every time I hear it. He said that pain is the megaphone of God. God's speaking to us all the time, often in whispers, but with pain loudly. And I understand what he means, but the image I have is a football player and a football coach on the sidelines just yelling at his team. Okay, 100 more push-ups. Everyone, of you, get down right now. You know, and, and I don't think that's what Lewis intended, and I don't think that's what the megaphone of God should be. I prefer a different uh, image, and that's God's, it's a hearing aid that we can turn up. So when, when something bad happens, you've got an option. How do I respond? I can either turn off, well, if God's going to treat me like that, I'm never going to pay any attention to it the rest of my life. Or you can say, is there something that I can learn? I don't believe that God specifically caused this to make me hurt, but it has happened. Is there something that I can take away that's a good thing? I, I read a survey the other day that of elderly Britons, people in, in London particularly, who lived through the Blitz, 60% of them say that that was their favorite time in life. I mean, they were losing like 3,000 people a day, and they're spending the night in these tube stations, these uh, subway stops with water and rats and all that. But they became a community. They would sing songs together. The royalty would come to visit them. And they look back and say, that, that was really living. We, we were fighting evil. If we just sustained, we could beat the forces of Nazism in, in Germany, as they did. And I think of what we're going through right now. We should be learning a lot about our society. For one thing, hello, it's possible to get along without professional sports. <laughs> there are no sports. <laughs> and, and who are the heroes? The heroes, well, just a couple of weeks ago, Time Magazine had these cafeteria workers in Dallas, Texas, who are spooning food for the needy children. Janitors. Janitors are at the top. You go to an airport, they are as important to your safety as the pilot of your airplane because they're wiping off the banisters, the seats, the doorknobs of the restrooms. So otherwise you could get the virus and you could die. Teachers, you know, we, we pay these athletes $10 million a year in some cases for chasing the ball around. A teacher makes one one hundredth of that. But as many parents who are stuck home with their kids <laughs> with a full-time job trying to teach them at home know we should value teachers more. <laughs> And in every major city at eight o'clock at night in, in Denver, we have this tradition of, of howling to thank the healthcare workers. These are people in the front lines, people we don't think about much, you know, the orderlies who change bedpans and make the beds in the hospitals. These are, pe these are people keeping us alive. And, and we should learn something about a society because hedge fund managers, they're not doing us any good right now. Um, they're, they're just trying to pick up the pieces of a, 
of a yo-yoing stock market, uh, we, we ought to be paying attention to the people who are unemployed and those people who process our food. You know, these, these are the really the people who keep society going. And it's, it's a time when all of us as Americans in a global community actually should reevaluate because you, you go back and read the Beatitudes. Jesus says, the last shall be first, the first shall be last. And it's the people who, who are poor or people who are mourn, who mourn, who are persecuted. These are the ones who are, who are blessed. And I, I, I learned a phrase from Dr. Paul Brand that I, I've worked with on a number of books including this latest one, Fearfully and Wonderfully. And he said, a healthy body is not a body that feels no pain. He worked with leprosy patients. They feel no pain and they destroy their own bodies because they have nothing to protect them. A healthy body is not a body that feels no pain. It's a body that attends to the pain of the weakest part. Mm. And that's what we should be doing as a church and as a whole society. What a beautiful way to end this, Philip. That's such a beautiful illustration and a call to the body of Christ and the church globally that somehow this continues. Some of the heroes of the of, of our world right now that that would continue and we'd learn something from this. That was a beautiful closing illustration. We've learned a lot today, Philip. Thank you so much. I don't want to cut this off. If you have any other anything else that... Uh, is on your mind that you'd want to share related to this topic before we close it out? That you've been a big blessing to to us and all who will be watching this. Well, speaking of uh, of our well, all that we have in common, I know you guys have both spent some time working at Denver Seminary, and at least I think you're on the board now. And I had a conversation with with Mark Young, the president, recently, and he he had just talked to a Denver Seminary graduate. I, I think it was a woman who had become a hospice and hospital chaplain. She worked in a nursing home and she called him and, and talked the other day and she said, I have been with 14 people in my home as they died. I actually held them as they died. Their families weren't allowed in. And then I had to go out into the lobby and explain. They wanted full details of what that was like. 14 times I have done that. And, and she asked, where, where is God? Where is God? And when Mark asked me to that, I said, well, it's pretty clear. God was in that woman. <laughs> God was in the person that you trained to be the literal hands and feet of Jesus. That's what the body of Christ means. Where is God when it hurts? Where is the church when it hurts? That's part of the answer to that question. It's not the full answer, but it's part of the answer. And, and that's what we're supposed to be doing right now. There's that lovely phrase in 2 Corinthians, the father of compassion, the God of all comfort. May those of us who have experienced some of the God of all comfort, the Father of compassion, take that comfort and compassion to the rest of the world. That's what we should be doing. Well, thank you, Philip. This has meant a lot to us. I know we've both been blessed by you and your dear wife, and uh, we're just thankful we had the time for this today. I just encourage everyone, as you're watching this again, there's more to Philip through his website. If you want to connect with him, philipyancey with one L.com. And of course, as Elisa mentioned, we have a lot of uh, materials from Philip. He's been involved with several things, Discover the Word, a radio program. You'll find some programs there that have been archived there, a new program. God Hears Her. And also, you want to sign up for Philip's blog as well. And then uh, for more on these conversations, we hope you'll go to uh, christianuniversity.org. That's the group that uh, is helping sponsor these, where I serve. And also just see our Daily Bread Ministries website, ourdailybread.org. So that'll give you a few links to click on and take some time as you're locked up. And uh, we just hope you'll have an opportunity to do that. God bless you, Philip. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Philip, for being here. And thanks, for everybody, for joining. And I'm looking forward to the time when we can actually be in your living room instead of virtually. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. That'll be great. Okay. Thanks so much, Philip. Bye for now. Goodbye.